Good morning, everyone. If you're looking for the shared experience form, you're in the right place. My name is Janine Suttle, Program Co Coordinator for the Mission Success is in Our Hands Shared Experience Forum. I'm here with our industry partner, Jacobs Engineering, and we have the Mission Success team is in our hands, a key uh, set of professionals that make this initiative seamless. Uh, we have an awesome program prepared for you today. We have, we're excited to present Dr. Ellen Ochoa, and this concludes our series for 2019. So, but please stay tuned for 2020 slate of speakers. I want to move quickly because we are short on time, um, but I want to ask you all to silence your phones. I have a few housekeeping things to go over. Silence your phones. If you have any questions, um, please save them until the end of the speaker's presentation. And finally, in the event of a fire emergency, we would have you exit these doors and go out to the designated area uh, outside of the building. In the event of a weather emergency, we would move quickly to the basement of this building. Without further ado, I will go on to tell you more about um, our feedback cards. You should have gotten the feedback cards. Um, Look on the back of those feedback cards, uh, fill out your feedback cards, and also on the back of those, give us a name of a person that you would think would be a great candidate for our Golden Eagle Award, which you will hear more about as we move through the program. Like I said, we will have our industry partner come up and give you the welcome. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. I typically don't need a microphone, so I'll project as best I can anyway. Um, I just want to welcome you all. We're delighted to have so many people here today. We've, we've also got the overflow rooms and we're recording. And we have a very special speaker today. I promise I won't steal Rick's thunder and do the intro for him, but it's, it's a rare opportunity to hear from someone who has shown leadership in as many ways as, as Ellen has in, in her time in uh, academia, in the uh, astronaut corps, and then as a, as a leader at JSC. So we're very fortunate to have her here. Um, mm -hmm. I want to talk just quickly about uh, Mission Success uh, is in Our Hands initiative. We've collaborated with, with Rick and his organization, Safety and Mission Assurance, for several years now. Um, we've, we've had wonderful speakers like Jan Davis, who's here with us today, um, presenting some really fascinating topics and, and sharing their perspective on things. So this is kind of the, the star or the, the highlight of our, of our overall program, but it, it really consists of a number of other things. And it's really focused on helping our workforce understand the role that they play on making sure that the missions that, that we support and execute are done safely and that the crews that we support are, are always kept at the forefront of safety. So you'll see the, the pop-up banners and posters around the center. Um, we have the uh, locations on ExploreNet where we share information. And then as I said, this is really the highlight. One of the ways, next slide. So one of the ways that we really do recognize and engage the workforce is through the Golden Eagle Award. So it's something that, that we as a team created to recognize the people that have made significant and noteworthy contributions to the protection of, of, of our crews and our assets. So you'll see a number of people on the, on the screen here that have been recognized over the years. We've had folks from various contractors from, from NASA's workforce as well. And I think Rick has got another award to present for us today. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rick and, and let him do the award. Thank you, Thank you Randy. Uh, part of this uh, always includes uh, a presentation of a Golden Eagle Award. Uh, the intent of the Golden Eagle Award is to promote awareness and appreciation for connections between employees' everyday work and the success of NASA and Marshall missions and safety of our astronauts. And it recognizes those individuals who have made uh, significant contributions to flight safety and uh, mission assurance. And uh, as Randy mentioned, anybody can nominate uh, a Golden Eagle Award candidate. 
And uh, the, the, as Janine mentioned, you can uh, put names on the back of your feedback card, or you can go to the uh, uh, Golden Eagle Award link on the Marshall uh, ExploreNet page under Mission Success is in our hands. So um, just remember that. Um, today, it's my honor to present uh, the award uh, for this uh, Mission Success event to Mr. Boyd McNutt, a Jacobs employee, um, a, a fabricator and welder who works in the ER-63 group over in our propulsion lab area, building 4205. Uh, and I'm, let me tell you a little bit about uh, how he has earned this distinction. Uh, when Marshall was installing new hydraulic relief valves in the core stage thrust vector control subsystem test article, uh, partially to mitigate the CERC pump overpressurization event late last year, which some of you may re have remembered, some new tubing was required. Well, that tubing um, uh, needed to be bent and flared and, and sent to a local vendor for cleaning. The cleanliness requirements on tubing in, in those systems is extreme, uh, very extreme. And so uh, cl the class four standards uh, are, are high. Uh, high level requirements. When the tubing came back uh, complete and certified from that vendor, uh, Mr. McNutt noticed that there were visible contaminants inside those tubes. I mean, he observed that and uh, he called employees he knew at, at this vendor and they, uh, they promptly, promptly accepted this tubing back and recleaned it. And since they corrected this issue on the same day and with no cost impact, Marshall was able to push forward with the installation without negatively affecting the assembly schedule. And um, it's that kind of attention to detail and a sense of ownership and what you're doing that that's what mission success is in our hands is all about. Mission success, we all own. And so this is a fine example. So his stop work call and proactive efforts exemplify Marshall's mission success values. And he has earned the Golden Eagle Award today and I'm very proud to present it to him. And I will read the citation uh, from his plaque. It says, Boyd McNutt discovered that some tubing sections from a recent component installation were not up to lab standards and then subsequently pulled this hardware out for recleaning and thus avoided potential damage to the Space Launch System core stage auxiliary power unit test article. Very critical uh, move on his part to save us uh, a lot of cost, schedule, and potential uh, latent defect that would have potentially been a, a problem. So, uh, at this time, I would like to invite Mr. McNutt up for the presentation. Exemplary. Thank you. Now, moving on, I get to introduce our guest uh, speaker today, which is also a great uh, privilege uh, and honor to, to represent uh, Marshall Space Flight Center and welcoming uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Ellen Ochoa, today. Uh, as many of you may already know from what you've read and, and some of our posters and flyers, and, and uh, she's the former director of NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston uh, from 2013 until her retirement in uh, May of 2018. She was the first Hispanic woman to go to space when she flew on a nine-day mission um, aboard Shuttle Discovery back in 1993. She has flown in space four times, logging nearly 1,000 hours. Uh, uh, currently serving on several boards, including vice chair of the National S Science Board, chair of the Nomination Evaluation Committee, 
for the National Medal of Technology and Innovation and as a corporate director. Prior to her astronaut career, Dr. Ochoa was a research engineer and holds uh, three patents for optical systems. And uh, just more uh, unbelievable uh, achievement for her, she received her bachelor's of science in physics from San Diego State and then both a master's and PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. Uh, not too shabby, huh? <laughs> uh, she is honored to have six schools named for her, and she's been inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame, the California Hall of Fame, and the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. Let's give Dr. Ellen Ochoa a warm martial welcome. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be here. I've, uh, of course, spent a lot of time at Marshall. You know, starting my, my first two missions were Space Lab pallet flights, and we were studying um, the Earth's atmosphere and particularly the problem of the ozone hole and ozone depletion. So I came to Marshall quite a bit um, because we, that's where we got our payload training to operate the Space Lab systems and the instruments that were attached to, uh, to the Space Lab pallet. So got to come go back and forth quite a bit pretty early in my career. And, and then after I got into management at Johnson Space Center, of course, I was here um, occasionally for meetings, um, including when I was at center director. So it's always a pleasure to be back here at Marshall. Um, very excited to be um, part of your shared experiences and to come back and, and share lessons learned, which I think is absolutely critically important in the business that we're in. And uh, hopefully you get something out of every speaker that comes here and uh, something out of me as well. You know, of course, some advice is more uh, helpful than others. I remember when I first joined the astronaut office and um, one of the pieces of advice that I heard from veteran astronauts was like, well, don't worry, there's really only two ways you can mess up as an astronaut. One is failing to follow the procedures exactly as written, and the other one is following the procedures exactly as written. <laughs> So uh, I don't know about you, Jan, but um, I couldn't decide if that was extremely unhelpful, um, you know, very profound, or somewhere um, of a combination of the two. Um, but you know, obviously, as I as I went through training and as, and as I spent quite a bit of time um, in operations, you know, it it became obvious really what they were trying to talk about. So obviously, um, the procedures are written based on a, on a thorough knowledge of how the systems operate, and it was um, our responsibility and the responsibility of everybody in the human spaceflight program to learn those systems to, and to understand how they operate, and then develop procedures that um, will. Uh, give you the best chance for achieving mission success and crew survival at the same time um, by understanding how those systems operate. But uh, any procedures that you develop ahead of time aren't necessarily going to be the best in every situation because there might be a combination of things going on, uh, of failures or other things that have happened that would actually lead you to want to do something different in a particular case. And so understanding that, working as a team, um, bringing in judgment that you learn over a period of time as you work with them is really the second part of that. And, and I think that was really what that advice was trying to get, um, get us to understand. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is really my experiences um, primarily in management. Um, so let me just set the stage a little bit. Uh, after I had flown on four space shuttle missions, I was given the opportunity uh, to become deputy director of the Flight Crew Operations Directorate. So, that, so that's the directorate at, at JSC um, that manages the astronaut office and our aircraft ops division. And um, it's the director and the deputy who really sit in on like the shuttle um, control boards, um, flight readiness reviews and um, on mission management teams and represents the flight crew. So I took that position in December of 2002 and the very first mission um, that I worked as a, manage, as, as a manager uh, was STS-107, the Columbia, in, uh, in 2003. So, um, but let me 
the very first month I was in this position, uh, one of the first meetings that I went to was a Space Shuttle Council meeting. And for those of you who are here in the Space Shuttle days, um, that was a meeting we had every few months where they brought in um, essentially all the managers um, across all the shuttle systems that supported it, and they talked about issues supporting the program. So this is my very first council meeting. And the primary thing that we were talking about was uh, the manifest and the schedule and how we were going to get to um, the initial phase of assembly complete of the International Space Station. And um, many of you uh, might remember that the NASA administrator had sent out a screensaver, had a date on it, February of 2004. This was when we were going to be what they called core complete um, for the sp space station. And so a good part of this meeting was the, the manifest person briefing um, where we were on the schedule. And it turned out we'd lost 90 days of schedule in the last half of 2002. Um, they talked about, well, we think we can mitigate 30 days of it, but we're still down 60 days. We were working a main engine issue at the time. Um, they talked about how many days of margin we had um, to the next flight. Um, they uh, asked uh, the USA contractor to work the entire um, holiday season, with the only days off being Christmas Eve, Christmas, and New Year's, um, but working the rest of it because they were really concerned about the schedule. The one, I would say, other briefing that really stuck out in my mind was then the orbiter project manager got up and said, well, here's what's keeping me awake at night. Um, the fact that the way we actually um, operate and process um, the vehicle is different than the way we certify it. And he gave an example where the oxygen lines were certified to move only 90 one thousandths of an inch um, as you went through uh, processing the vehicle. And yet, the way the vehicle was being processed, um, people were actually stepping on those lines um, as they went in to do work. So probably moving them a good half inch uh, or so, rather than less than 90 thousandths of an inch. And if, if you looked at the entire way the vehicle was being processed, um, he was concerned that there were many examples where we were actually processing the vehicle in quite a different way than it had been certified. And so he uh, wanted to use this meeting to kick off an effort to actually uh, look at how we were operating versus certification and, and then understand how we either had to change how we were operating or we had to look at um, certifying um, the different parts of the vehicle to the way things were actually happening. Uh, well, fast forward about six weeks and um, you know, we obviously had the worst tragedy that you can have in the business that we were in, where we lost a vehicle and we lost a crew. And for a while, it wasn't clear whether we had actually lost human spaceflight as well, because we didn't know whether or not the shuttle was going to be allowed to continue operating. So it was a, you know, it was a, an extremely difficult time for, for everyone associated uh, with human spaceflight. And, um, Hopefully, any, anybody and everybody in this room has actually read the report that came out of it, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, which is the independent uh, body that it was formed after the accident to uh, review what had happened. We also had an, an internal NASA team, so there are actually two reports that came out. And they're, they're both very um, important and interesting to understand, but I'm just going to read one paragraph out of the CABE report that talked not so much about um, the technical issue of, of the foam uh, falling off the tank, but some of the organizational flaws that they pointed out. The organizational causes of this accident are rooted in the space shuttle program's history and culture, including the original compromises that were required to gain approval for the shuttle program, subsequent years of resource constraints, fluctuating priorities, schedule pressures, mischaracterization of the shuttle as operational rather than developmental, and lack of an agreed national vision. Cultural traits and organizational practices detrimental to safety and reliability were allowed to develop, including reliance on past success as a substitute for sound engineering practices, organizational barriers which prevented effective communication of critical safety information, and stifled professional differences of opinion, lack of integrated management across program elements, 
and the evolution of an informal chain of command and decision-making processes that operated outside the organization's rules. So those were things we had to work on in addition to the actual changes to, for example, foam on the tank and the things that directly um, contributed to that accident. And so there were a number of processes that, that we did change. We changed training for people that were members of the mission management team and, and really did try to work a, on uh, communication. And we spent um, essentially two and a half years as a team and even though I was the deputy director of flight crew operations, um, I was actually the one that went to the weekly um, shuttle program control board um, PRCB meetings, um, where every single week, we, as a team, we were making decisions about changes that either had to be made or didn't have to be made for us to return to flight. And there was quite a, a wide variety of opinions um, uh, in that time about what actually needed to be done before we should return to flight. Uh, so we made it through that period, and so now we're getting ready to launch uh, STS-114, the return to flight mission. It's July um, in 2005, and as we, uh, as we tank up and, and try to launch that day, it turns out that we had a particular sensor that wasn't working. It was called the engine cutoff sensor. And um, so, uh, again, just a little bit of history, because I'm going to spend a little bit of time on these, uh, what we call the eco sensors. And some of you um, may know way more than I actually do about the, about the sensors, just based on your background. But I'm, I'm going to tell this story from my point of view. Um, so there were four of these sensors in the external tank. And they're part of a backup system that are intended to make sure that the engines um, either don't shut down too early, which would result in an abort, or run too long, which would drain the tank dry. Um, and that's the situation that you particularly worry about, because if you dra uh, uh, drain the tank dry, you could um, have catastrophic results, again, losing the entire vehicle and the crew. Um, so even though you're unlikely to need this backup system, because presumably you've loaded more fuel than you need, and so you're not actually going to run out of fuel, um, if you did need to use this system, it's absolutely critical um, for the survival, survival of the vehicle and the crew. So this backup system had actually been put to the test twice in the history of the shuttle program. Once was in 1985, where a main engine had shut down during launch due to a, a completely different sensor failing. And that affected the fuel consumption on the remaining two engines. And so it actually did result in an eco-sensor engine cutoff. And then there was another um, mission, um, STS-93 in 1999. Actually, that was commanded by Eileen Collins, who's, who's here today. I got to see her this morning. Um, uh, and they had a hydrogen link in a coolant tube of one of the main engine nozzles that caused more oxygen to be consumed than expected. So then the oxygen um, eco-sensor triggered an engine shutdown in that case. So again, even though you don't expect to run out of fuel, this system was put in place so that should you actually be running out of fuel, um, you would shut down before the engine broke apart and, and broke up the vehicle. Now, I didn't know it at the time we had this, um, uh, this issue, but um, there had actually been quite a history of eco-sensor problems throughout the whole shuttle program, including in several tanking tests and also several launch countdowns um, many years before uh, the year that we are talking about. Um, so we hadn't seen it in a while, and this particular sensor was failing in a way that it actually indicated the tank was full to a certain point when it actually wasn't. So it was fooling you into thinking you had more fuel than you had. Um, and we had a flight rule. And again, flight rules are developed um, when there's no time pressure, when you have everybody who's involved in understanding that system and in operating the vehicle together in a room. And you de develop flight rules so that when you are under a time pressure, for example, example, a launch countdown or during launch, you default to the flight rules um, because they've already covered you for so many situations. So the flight rule at that time was all four sensors need to be working or you don't launch. Well, we spent a month trying to figure out this problem, and I remember being in at work every single day during that launch, seven day, uh, during that month, seven days a week. We were never able to come to a root cause, but 
we ended up rewriting the flight rule, which said, uh, okay, if this is a first launch attempt, we're gonna stand down if there's a, a, a failure of one of these sensors. If we tank up again the next day and the same sensor is failing with the same signatures, but the other three have looked good, both, both attempts, then we will go ahead and launch with the, with the theory that you still had three good sensors. And again, that you also needed another failure, in other words, um, not enough fuel, in order to actually use this system. Now, what we really didn't know was, uh, because we didn't understand the failure, we didn't know if this was a common cause failure or not. In other words, was it something that could affect all of the sensors in the system, or was it particular to the particular sensor that was in this vehicle? But obviously, because we'd had a history of sensor issues, um, you know, there was some concern there was a common cause failure, and that's a very important question because it really changes the risk equation. Um, if you think they're independent failures, there's really no reason to think any of the other um, sensors are gonna fail, and that gives you more confidence in launching with less than all four. But if, if it's something that could potentially affect one or more of the remaining sensors, you're in a very different situation. But anyway, we did end up uh, rewriting the rule. Um, we finally did launch um, near the end of that month when we were able to tank up, and I, I don't actually remember whether it was the first or the second launch attempt. Um, we actually had another issue with foam falling off that tank, if you remember, so it was a year later before we went to the second mission after uh, Columbia. And we scrubbed twice for eco-sensor failures before we were able to launch um, that particular time. Um, you know, there were people in the community who felt like we should be able to launch even on the first attempt with just one failure. Um, but again, because of the fact that we didn't understand whether it was a common cause failure or not, we never had the full engineering operations and safety community that could agree to that. So we kept with this um, launch rule that on a first attempt you needed all four. So there was a, a theory postulated about these sensors um, and maybe the way they worked in the cryogenic temperatures. And so we instituted a, a, a different, more detailed inspection of the sensors before we um, put them in the vehicle. And um, uh, we, everybody thought that was gonna fix the problem because we were actually able to weed out some sensors that didn't pass this test. So everybody thought, okay, we, we think maybe we found the problem. So now we come to the launch that I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on, STS-115 launch. This is September of 2006. So these sensors had gone through this new inspection. Um, and so we came in that morning and um, the director of flight crew operations was in Florida with the mission management team. And as the deputy, I was um, at mission control in, um, in Houston, um, monitoring the, the uh, launch from there. So we tank up and we, we test these sensors and we have a failure of one of the eco sensors. And, and there was a certain amount of troubleshooting that you could do during a launch countdown, which, which we had done in previous launches and which we continue to do during this launch countdown. With the idea is it's possible we'll, under, you know, we'll get some new information, we'll learn something new um, if, if we do a little bit of this troubleshooting. Um, and, and so while that was going on, um, you know, we continued with the launch countdown, but they, they finally came back. Um, this is probably an hour, an hour and a half before launch. And um, you know, I heard the full report of what they were saying and really there was nothing new. It was, it was really exactly what we had seen before. We didn't know what was causing it and, and this sensor was showing the same signature. So in Houston, we take a mini go, no go. So just the flight team um, that's operating in Houston. And of course, one of our, our flight controllers is the booster flight controller who's in charge of the main engines. So all the flight controllers in the room voted go, except the booster, who was no go, because he was following the flight rule <laughs> that we had in place. And he was also very concerned, you know, being the one that was gonna have to make, a, potentially make a call during um, the launch phase about shutting it down an engine early, uh, you know, he wanted to make sure these sensors were working. Well, um, the flight director, he reports um, back to the launch mission management team in Florida, and he said, we're go in Houston. 
Now, he, of course, had the prerogative to listen to all of his flight controllers and then make the decision whether he thought the team was go or no go. So he certainly had the prerogative to overrule the booster. What surprised me a little bit, though, was that he did not mention on the loops to anybody um, on their, on, to the team in Florida that his booster was no-go, which I actually thought was an important piece of information, because that's the only flight controller in the room that is worried about this system. Um, so as they went around and then they, they polled the full team um, for mission management, um, the director of flight crew ops had already called me and said, Ellen, I want you to vote for the flight crew because I had been the one that had been in all the meetings over the last you know, um, uh, year and a half or so that had dealt with this issue. And so he just felt that I had more information and heard a lot more of the conversations about it. So again, I listened very carefully, hadn't heard any new information. Um, this is launch day, and what do you do? You, you stick with the flight rules unless there is some new piece of information that says you've learned something and you feel that there's a different risk posture. So I said I, I was no go. Well, the next thing that surprised me was everybody else on the team said that they were go. Um, because based on all the conversations we had, I had assumed there would be several other people um, that was voting no go. Let me just give you a little bit of um, other color that was going on. This particular launch had already been delayed three times, uh, once for a malfunction in one of the fuel cells, once after a lightning strike, and once due to weather from a tropical storm. So uh, let me quote a couple of uh, lines that you saw in the media. This agency is under pressure to launch Atlantis this week or face delaying its mission to the ISS until October. That was written September 8th. Another quote, NASA now only has a brief launch window to get Atlantis off the ground or face a wait of at least two and a half weeks. So after I voted no-go, and it turned out I was the only one, the NASA administrator called me. I'm sitting in, in, mission, in mission control in Houston. So he's like, uh, so why exactly are you no-go? <laughs> Um, so, you know, I gave him my reasons, told him we had talked about this, you know, in, in, at a time when we had all the time in the world to talk about it, and we had developed a flight rule. I was following the flight rule. And while we always have to be willing to take risks, because there's no way of launching in, people into space without taking risk, that I wasn't willing to take a risk that we did not understand, and we did not know why these sensors were working. So, uh, so his comment was, well, if the flight crew's no-go, there's no way we can launch today, and we're not launching. And that was announced less than an hour before launch time. So a little bit about the rest of the story. The next day, we tanked up again. Sensors were working fine, as far as we could tell. We launched, no issue, got into space. So now a new theory was postulated about the sensors. A, a new inspection was instituted. And the next four, and so, and so all the sensors underwent this new inspection. The next four flights launched with no sensor issues. Everybody's like, we've solved this problem. Fifth flight, two sensors failed during the countdown. Another failed after the drain. We tried to launch again three days later, had another sensor fail. And the shuttle program manager finally said, okay, we are not tanking up again until we understand what is going on with these sensors, till we've actually gotten to root cause. So this is something we probably should have done two years earlier, but we didn't do it until this time. And again, it's this, it's this feeling of, well, we've got to go launch. You know, that's what we do in this business. We've got to go launch. So, um, so they put together a full test system, and um, after a particular tanking test, we started focusing on the connector that passes the electrical systems from the sensors through the wall of the external tank to the shuttle. And then they postulated that movement inside this connector caused some of the metal pins um, to stop touch, touching the metal inside the sockets. And as they investigated it, it turned out that a dozen years earlier, the Centaur stage of a Titan Centaur rocket had had the exact same problem, which had been fixed by permanently soldering connecting pins um, and the socket of these connectors. So we actually hired the very same technicians that soldered those connectors, brought them over to the shuttle program temporarily, 
um, it had them solder our connectors, and we were able to um, complete that work in a few weeks instead of a few months because of using these people who were familiar with this, um, this problem. And um, we had another 13 flights on the shuttle program and never had another sensor problem after that. So, um, so it was a common cause failure. In fact, it didn't have anything to do with the sensors at all. It had to do with the, the getting the signals from the sensors to the computers. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the real lesson is we didn't take the time to understand the risk. And remember that this first launch that we delayed because of a sensor issue was the very first one after Columbia, where the main issue was we didn't understand the vehicle as well as we thought we did. And so we had this whole team of people who thought we had learned all these lessons, and we had learned a lot of lessons, and yet we still did not take the time to understand what was going on with these eco-sensors. Again, a system that if it's not working right and you have a bad day in terms of how much fuel you're using, you can lose the crew in the vehicle. Um, so interestingly, a couple years later, the NASA administrator, Mike Griffin, gave a speech on NASA and engineering integrity, and there was um, a paragraph that I'd like to read out of that because I used to also remind my team about this. In engineering practice, integrity is speaking up in a meeting when you do not believe the facts match the conclusions being reached or that certain facts are being ignored. Integrity is following the data. Integrity is refusing to fall in love with your own analysis, admitting when you are wrong when presented with new data that should alter your earlier view. Integrity is keeping a promise or commitment, or when circumstances change, explaining why an agreement cannot be kept. Integrity is walking into your boss's office, closing the door, and speaking with frankness, openness, and honesty, and listening the same way. Integrity is being willing to put your badge on your boss's desk when you believe that an ethical breach warrants such drastic action. So I think these are the things that we need to be thinking about, especially as we're coming back up to a time period when we're going to be launching from the U.S. again. And we all know there are a lot of people that are now working in the human spaceflight business that were not working when we were launching regularly um, with the shuttle and from Florida. And so now we're going to be going through these very detailed flight readiness reviews, and we're going to be going through launch countdowns. And so trying to remember the lessons um, from the past, I think, is, is absolutely critically important. Um, so. Uh, I ended up uh, you know, taking a variety of other jobs and then eventually becoming the center director. And the JSC center director has a special role at a flight readiness review. So we have the center directors of, of all the human um, space flight centers, so JSC, Marshall, Kennedy, Stennis, as part of the flight readiness review. Um, and so they're, they're there to listen and ask questions, but also specifically to certify that the work that, that their centers have been um, responsible for um, is ready to go and that they're essentially vouching for the work that their centers have done. The JSC center director, though, has an additional task or an additional role. Um, when the JSC center director signs off, they're actually accepting the risk for the crew to go fly on that flight. So it goes beyond certifying that whatever JSC is responsible for is ready to go. Um, and so the center director, even more than, uh, everybody on the team has this responsibility, but the center director is really signing off saying, I've listened to everybody's presentation um, for all the systems, um, and, and, and I believe that we are ready to launch, or sometimes there's um, a little bit of open work, but given that the open work is done, that we are ready to go launch. So in that, so in that case, um, in that position, I was still um, in the position of really signing off for the crew. Well, when I was both deputy and center director, of course, we learnt, weren't launching from the U.S., and so we weren't having the same kind of flight readiness reviews as we did for the shuttle. But we still had these reviews in advance of all the Soyuz missions. And, and those presented sort of different issues and different problems. Obviously, we didn't have nearly as much information 
on Soyuz systems and engineering details, though fortunately there's quite a bit of flight history because they've been flying for a long time, although with periodic updates to equipment, to avionics, to, and to software. And, and so as we work through various issues, people both at JSC and here at Marshall have become more and more knowledgeable about the shuttle. And of course, it's not always about a, a launch issue. Sometimes um, you're working an issue, for example, we had one um, where this, you know, how the seats um, actually crank up on landing for a, a Soyuz vehicle, and we had an issue about one that didn't properly deploy on landing, and we were trying to understand um, if the ones on orbit uh, were gonna have the same issue. Um, I know when I first started going to those, um, we would often be told by the Russian Space Agency, um, you know, don't worry, we've investigated that and we fixed the issue with absolutely no details given. <laughs> and you know, when you're used to shuttle, you know, you'd have a, a 50 page briefing, you know, on here's what we found, here's what we've done. You know, um, and so to, to hear like one sentence was, was not exactly satisfying. And, and, and so we, you know, we kind of morphed over the years where we would develop a list of questions um, which would, you know, have to do with this concern, hopefully, of course, in advance of the flight readiness review. Um, and, and there'd be some email exchanges back and forth um, uh, trying to understand a little bit more about what the cause and what the mitigation was done. And then our folks would try as best as they could to do sort of an independent risk assessment. Um, again, without full knowledge, but at least trying to bound the problem so that we would understand uh, the risk to which we were signing up from. Sometimes we would ask for photos from an on-orbit vehicle or for updated procedures a little bit more information on manufacturing details or inspections, and um, occasionally we were able to get a full report from their commission, their general designer's review, which was, was their version of a flight readiness review. You know, we had a couple of big issues that had to do with progress failures, and as you know, they often make changes to the progress vehicle first, um, because that's a cargo vehicle, no people are on board, and, and, and have a few of those flights before then they actually change the Soyuz vehicle itself, which is a very good approach um, to making upgrades and changes. Um, in, in a couple of those failures, um, and, and kudos to Marshall folks, we had to do some pretty extensive reverse engineering, particularly when we had a failure on, on a re-entry that, that caused um, uh, one of our crews to go into a ballistic mode um, to really try to understand uh, what had happened, um, ask the right information, and feel that we were prepared to give a go for the next launch. Another challenge that we have now, and of course I was working this up until a little over a year ago when I left NASA, is the commercial crew program. And, and again, we're in a situation where it's quite different than the shuttle program. We don't have nearly as much information about those systems as we did on the vehicles that, that we owned. Um, and, and so we, we do require um, certain um, either information or at least uh, uh, the fact that these companies have done certain things as they have designed, tested, and, and built their equipment. And you know, we've worked to everything from the Boeing in-flight abort test um, to the COPVs um, of SpaceX. And I would say each presented some difficult issues and decisions, um, but the people on the team that we were um, using to look at the risk really had to use the judgment gained over many years, and because and most, most of these people had shuttle experience, in trying to ask the questions that would give us the most information and allow us to make a risk assessment. You know, and so in particular, um, when uh, SpaceX had the COPV issue, and um, I'm not actually even sure if they're completely done with all of the testing, but uh, you know, we talked about we really need to make sure that there's a physics-based approach to certifying these COPVs, which we all know in actually manufacturing them is, can be as much art as science. So you really have to identify all possible ignition mechanisms, test to character, characterize and understand what e which each of those mechanisms are, um, and then the test should identify the driving parameters for, for the ignition me mechanisms to establish sort of a worst case condition and add margin. And in that way, try to bound the risk that you um, are accepting with those um, COPVs. And then of course, conduct testing to demonstrate that you've controlled 
all the identified ignition mechanisms. And those are the things that we need to do whenever we have a, a, an issue like that. Uh, when uh, we initially don't fully understand the risk um, that a particular vehicle might be um, presenting to us. So um, overall, what I would say is one of the things that I would periodically reread, and, and I won't read it here, but um, if you haven't read lately um, the description of NASA's four core values, teamwork, integrity, excellence, and safety. There's just a little paragraph under each. Every time I went back and read them, I thought, these are really well-written paragraphs. <laughs> you know, people, we put a lot of time and effort into, into really developing what that means to us as a team. Um, and, and so, I, again, I would encourage um, people to really go back and reread those and think about the, you know, those, particularly before you go into um, a flight readiness um, uh, operation, which we are going to be doing shortly. Um, and I kind of wanted to finish up today with a little bit of fun. And, and to me, it follows up on the whole teamwork thing because, um, you know, space, human spaceflight in particular, all spaceflight really, but human spaceflight in particular, really does depend on teamwork. And, um, uh, you know, I would say when, you're, when I'm actually on orbit as a crew member, that is the thing I am thinking about, you know, uppermost in my mind. As, as I run through the procedures, I think about all the things that my training team has told me. Their voices are actually in my ear. Um, you know, when we're, when we're actually operating some of the shuttle systems, I'm thinking about the people that I have met um, all throughout the NASA team that have been responsible for various um, different parts of the system. And, um, and you realize like absolutely nothing gets done unless this whole team is working toward a goal and is incorporating those four values into everything that they do as they prepare for a mission and then as they actually operate and carry out that mission. So I'll, I'll just show about 10 minutes of this video. And again, let me give you a little bit of an introduction. You can see this was a while ago, okay. Um, it's been a little while since I've flown in space. So this was 2002. So um, this was actually my last mission. And as I mentioned, after this is when I, I started to go into these management roles. And this was the very first mission of sort of the second phase um, of the uh, International Space Station Assembly. So at this point, we did have three people living on board. You know, we had people that started living on board in November of 2000. So this is um, a year and a half later. Uh, and, and so we had a habitation vehicle, the, the U.S. laboratory was up, um, the airlock had gone up recently, the arm, the shuttle, the station shuttle, um, the station arm had gone up recently. So we had sort of all the basic capabilities that we needed and we had one solar array. And what we needed to do now was to start to build the truss. The, the truss that is now 350 feet long, but which didn't exist at this point, and, um, and then add three solar rays. And of course, that was going to allow us to power up the rest of the station and allow us to incorporate laboratories from uh, the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency. So, so this was the beginning of really being able to incorporate all of our international partners into um, the ISS um, as an international laboratory. And we were bringing up the very first piece of this trust structure called S0, which was about a little over 40 feet long, about 20,000 pounds, and attach it to the station and then uh, hook up and power up all the, all the information. So I think Doug's going to start the video. I'm going to narrate it, and then he's going to run back and turn off the lights, so hopefully you can see it just a little bit better. Um, so, of course, we had a crew of seven, as, as we normally did during the station um, assembly days, and this is us uh, getting ready to go out to the pad. Okay, you guys know all about the engines, so I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have to say anything about the engines to this audience. Um, but it's it's very exciting, of course, uh, when not only the main engines start up um, about five, seven seconds before launch, but then also the solid rockets. Uh, I'm right here. I'm the the flight engineer on this flight, so I'm supporting the commander and pilot during the dynamic phases of flight, which are not only. Um, ascent and entry, but also rendezvous and undock with the International Spa um, Space Station ISS. So just a few launch pictures, of course. It, it was a late afternoon and we'd had, there was an issue in launch control and they had to reset some of the computers 
and we actually launched, I think, with three seconds left in the launch window. So it was a little bit of an exciting launch countdown there. And then here's where the solid rocket boosters separate away from the, the rest of the, uh, the shuttle. And then this is our commander, Mike Bloomfield, um, better known as Bloomer. And so, of course, the first day and a half, what we're really doing is um, sort of changing it from a rocket into a spacecraft, a spaceship that we're going to use, and then um, performing burns that will allow us to rendezvous with the International Space Station. And again, Bloomer and our pilot Steve Frick and I um, worked together um, as a team uh, during the whole rendezvous process. So here you can see um, S0 in the bay, so it really takes up the whole bay other than the actual docking mechanism itself. And of course, the elements were all designed to take up the whole bay. I mean, that was the limiting element in how large you can build them. And, and that silver ball there is where we're gonna actually attach, uh, attach to. So that's the docking mechanism on the space station. And then here's the final part of the rendezvous and prox ops where we're, we're actually coming up to station, although from our vantage point, it looks like it's coming down to meet us. Um, but here's the final port, point of contact. And then we'd spend about 10 minutes bringing the two vehicles together and then about two hours doing a leak check. Yeah, Bloomer's very proud of his flying skills. And, um, and then we open the hatches and this is the commander of the space station, uh, Yuri Onofranco. And, uh, and then we uh, moved into the vehicle. There were two uh, NASA astronauts on board, actually members of my astronaut class. So it was really um, great to see them. They'd been on board about four months by the time we got up there. And then we got to work, and of course, um, every crew always had a lot of um, supplies to deliver as well, so we just started transferring supplies. Uh, of course, you can transfer them between your knees, not just in your hands, um, uh, as you're going from vehicle to vehicle. And then the next morning, um, we got to work and actually uh, started to, to pull S0. So I'm actually operating the uh, sh station robot arm at this point, pulling S0 up out of the payload bay. Um, of the shuttle, and then we'll be moving it around and attaching it to the Zenith side of the space st station. So here's the robotics workstation. This is before the cupola, so it, it's in the um, U.S. laboratory. And you'll notice it's not by any windows, so you don't get the benefit of actually looking out the window and seeing the arm. A and so you don't really have full view of the arm and all of its joints and angles, which makes it a little bit tricky. You can see the Nile River and the Gulf of Aqaba. Um, in the background um, as we're moving it around. And then this is kind of the final part of the install as we're moving it across the zenith um, side of the station. And that claw on the right there is going to attach to this rod over here and form the very first part of the attachment, although we'll, we'll do a much more complete attachment through spacewalking. Uh, that's astronaut Dan Bursch, who is one of the station crew members, and, and he and I operated the arm. He was actually at the controls when we did that final uh, attachment. So we were um, attached to station for about a week and after we installed S0 then we did a series of four spacewalks during that week and for all of these spacewalks we also used the robot arm either the sh um, station or the shuttle arm and so I was always operating the arm during the spacewalks. And these next few views are from the helmets um, uh, the cameras on the helmets of the spacewalking crew members, so you can see they're looking down, looking at their hands. Um, big cable trays that they had to attach. They had to um, bolt down some struts to do the final mechanical attachment of the uh, truss to the station. And then they had just a ton of cables to hook up. Um, cables providing power, um, doing power distribution. Um, sent cables that would allow you to send data to all of the instruments on the truss and um, commands and get data back. Um, so um, those spacewalks were all really quite busy. There's actually a, a spacewalker on the end of that arm there holding a piece of equipment that looks like a V. And then this is what it looks like um, when they come back in and you've actually already repressurized pre and we're bringing them in to, to take them out of their suits. This is on the shuttle side in the shuttle mid-deck, um, sharing a meal. It was actually during rodeo time in Houston, so we're wearing our rodeo gear, as you can probably see. Uh, this is Rex Walheim, and he's doing a video conference with his two little boys, so he's showing off a little bit about microgravity for them. Steve Smith, um, showing what, what liquids do, as you all well know, in, in microgravity. And then at the end of our week, um, 
Of course, we, uh, we closed the hatch between the two vehicles, uh, counting noses on each side pretty carefully. And, um, and then we got ready to undock. And, um, and our pilot, Steve Frick, was actually at the commands when we were undocking. So again, Steve Frick and Bloomer and I um, were the ones uh, really working together as the cockpit crew as we undocked. And um, if you remember, during these uh, assembly missions, what we would do is we'd move about 400 feet away. We'd wait for sunrise. And then we'd do a complete fly around of the station. And we would photo document the station. And that was used for future assembly missions so they knew exactly um, the condition of you know, every cable and, and every single thing on the outside of the station to better prepare for the upcoming um, assembly flight. So there's Steve Frick at the controls. That's what we look like from the station um, as we're leaving. Of course, the payload bay is empty except for the, the docking mechanism. Here we've flown about halfway around the station. Um, and are getting a, a view of it, a laser ranging device, and then of course these cameras that are doing the photo documentation. Then really our final good view. So, so this is what we've added to the station. Of course this is the arm. And uh, that was really our last good view of, uh, of the space station until we um, moved quite a bit farther away. We spent a day checking out all the shuttle systems and now this is the final morning um, of the mission, we're closing the payload bay doors and getting ready to, to do re-entry. Getting back um, into our launch and entry suits, which is always a little bit harder because you've grown just a little bit in space. And then this is just the very final part of re-entry. Um, so just as we're coming around the heading alignment cone at uh, Kennedy Space Center, you can see the heads up display going about 270 knots passing through 13,000 feet there, and you get a good view of the shuttle landing facility um, as we're coming in. When you get through 2,000 feet, that's when you finally do the, the pull-up, which uh, you definitely want to see, because other than that, it looks like you're dive bombing land way short of the runway. Um, and so we pull up, and then at 300 feet, put the gear down um, and get ready to land. Of course, when we touch down, we're still going well, well over 200 knots, which is significantly faster than an airliner. And of course, that's why we incorporated the drag chute um, a number of years into the program to help reduce the wear and tear on the tires and brakes and make for a safe uh, landing at the end. So if you want to stop it here, for other audiences, I've tacked on, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> when I show this other places, I've tacked on about five minutes of what the station looks like today, and you know, how much it's grown, and then um, a lot of views of some of the science that we have going on. But I know this audience is quite familiar with that, so. So I don't need to show that here. So uh, yeah, we can bring up the lights. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes. Ellen, when you, uh, when you made the, had that dissenting opinion for flight, and you were the only one on behalf of the crew, did you consult with the actual crew at all, get their opinion, or did you make that on your own? No, we, we sort of have this joke about you never ask the crew that's actually suited up inside the vehicle. Because like, like if they said, well, only one of the two SRBs is working, and the crew inside would be like, yeah, we're go. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is kind of a formality that when they go around, they do pull the commander. But the commander has never been anything but go in the history of the program. So, so that's why you have these managers who have the opportunity to hear all of the conversation and all of the different loops um, who are actually representing the crew and making that call for them. So I'm yeah. curious, did you have enough of a, a perspective on how the Russians operated to see how they made decisions, for go, no, go kinds of conversations? Yeah. Well, so I never had the opportunity to sit in on a general designer's review, which again is their version of a, of a flight readiness review. But we, we, we did have NASA people there, and they were um, usually people from the crew office. And so we got insight into the conversations that they had. And, and a lot of what we heard back was, it's actually pretty similar to, to what we do. 
Um, and they, you know, they have people that are representing the different systems and they go around and talk in a fair amount of detail. What just didn't always happen is we didn't, you know, we didn't, we didn't get those charts. We didn't get the, the benefit of actually having that conversation. But we would, um, we would be able to um, get sort of a summary from, from the folks that had attended. And then, of course, through the, international, um, the ISS program office, and again, this was usually a little bit ahead of that because we wanted to have something to talk about at our own flight readiness review. Um, whatever issues that we had that we felt we needed more information on, we would try to poll everybody and develop a list of, you know, a, a fairly short list of questions or things that we wanted, like we'd like to see this photograph or we'd like to um, understand the change that you made to the procedure to deal with this issue so that we would have some information. That wasn't happening maybe so much right at the beginning, um, but we, we were able to generate enough, you know, trust between and, and get to know the relationships well enough. And I will say, for example, Bill Gerstemeyer was very well respected by the Russians, so he would often just go over in person and just talk to various people and get a lot more information just personally talking to people and asking questions. And so it, if at some point we just felt like we haven't been able to extract the right information, Gerst would go over to Russia. <laughs> and, and, and they trusted him as, a, as an engineer and an operator. And they, you know, he had worked with the same people for many years based on when he was ISS program manager. And, and, and as you know, those personal relationships are really, really important um, in working cross-culturally. And, and so we would often get the benefit of, of hearing what he had learned. Thank you. So in that same light, so yeah. going back to what uh, Randy brought up on the uh, ISS side of the house and working with the Russians, you see that same pro process working for us when we start talking commercial crew? I know you kind of talked about that a little bit, but you think that's going to be the same kind of similar thing? Yeah, so I, I would say we have a little bit more of an advantage in that, in that, as you know, we've actually had people, you know, at both SpaceX and at Boeing, at, you know, for for a few years now. Uh, may, um, not everybody, every single day, in, in everything, but we we do have people who are physically there, um, who can watch certain kinds of tests, who can sit in on certain kinds of meetings and get a, more information like that, and and so because it's happening more continuously rather than just sort of at a big milestone. I, I, I do think we have a little bit more insight into to how they actually operate and how they develop and manufacture and that kind of thing. But it's still not the same as, as you know, what we were used to in the shuttle program. And so it, it's, it really is incumbent on, on folks to, to ask the appropriate risk questions that will allow us to do a risk assessment and, and understand you know, when there have been issues in particular you know, how have they uh, made sure that they understood what the root causes were, and then how have they actually mitigated that um, for future vehicles? And to, you know, to make sure that, you know, of course they've, uh, you know, for example, SpaceX has learned a lot by flying their, their cargo vehicle. But as, as you start to fly crew, to make sure that you understand um, anything that would happen during any of those missions, right? Which could tell you something that you didn't know about the vehicle or the launch process or the landing process that you then need to f um, fold into um, future uh, builds and that kind of thing. Because as we know, these vehicles are always talking to us, but we gotta be listening, we gotta be looking for it. And we, and we importantly, we have to be following up and just and not just saying, well, everything went fine this time, so we're good. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, and then uh, you. <laughs> so as, as we look in the future, HLS will probably go. If we go in 2024, that will be without a prior uncrewed demonstration mission, most likely. So both from the standpoint as a launch director and a go-no-go -no -go decision, mm -hmm. and as a crew member, what would you need to see to be comfortable <coughs> flying uh, HLS the 2024 mission? Yeah, so you have to look at what haven't you had the chance to test, particularly in a flight environment that really needs the flight environment to, to, to test out. And then is what are those things that you can do on the ground or ahead of time that give you a little bit more information, that help you understand a little bit more the risk 
of that which you haven't had the opportunity to test. And then how does that play in, particularly into crew survivability? Um, because, you know, there's, there's two categories. One is mission success, which of course we're always trying to achieve. But, you know, the higher category is you at least want the crew to survive and have that opportunity to go do another mission. Um, and so those things that you know that are particularly critical for that. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to really test it in the environment in which it's going to be used, then you just have to look very carefully at um, you know, any analysis or any ground testing or whatever that you can use to help understand or bound um, that risk so that you have some idea of what risk you're taking. It, 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 it's not easy. But it's important not to just throw your hands up and just say, well, because we don't have all the information, we, just, we can't do this. We don't know how to do a risk assessment. You, 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 have to, you have to work hard at understanding what are the questions we can ask, what are the analyses we can do, what are the sort of the subtests you know, that we, we can do here on the ground that will help us understand that risk and help us um, achieve the mission. Say yes, we can fly <laughs> <laughs> What's there in the vehicle? <laughs> yes. Now, I'm not saying a week or a month or a year ahead of time, yes, but the actual crew, once you're suited up in the vehicle, you know, it's, that's just not the time to, uh, to be pulling the crew. <laughs> uh, so, yes, in the front row. Uh, yes, you quoted the uh, paragraph from Mike Griffin about personal integrity yeah. and responsibility. From your experience as an institutional leader, uh, what practices or examples do you have that enable and incentivize that type of personal integrity? Well, you know, it, it was after Columbia, you know, every time we met as either a PRCB or then um, right prior to a mission for a flight readiness review or during the mission as a mission management team, you know, those were the kinds of things I would try to keep in mind, and I, and I think many people tried to keep in mind. So, so one of the things is we tried to understand, okay, what is it that prevents people from speaking up, for example? And, and there's a variety of things that do it. Um, I, I would say overall, the emphasis that we put in inclusion in our culture is extremely important. Because if you come in every day and you don't feel like you're included, like you feel like there's a group of insiders and a group of outsiders and you're an outsider, how likely are you to raise your hand or to bring up something that you think isn't being appropriately considered? You know, you need people to feel like they're insiders, to feel that they're valued, that what, they're, what they say will be listened to. And so that's something that you can think about every single day as you go to work. Now, in the, in the context of a flight readiness review or a mission management team meeting, um, as, we, as each organization did their part of the flight readiness review that would build up to the programs, um, we all would specifically ask for dissenting opinions. Um, so part of it is asking. And if there's somebody representing um, an organization sitting around the table that really hasn't said anything during the flight review, then as a, as a center director, I would say, well, I haven't heard from you know, human health and performance. Um, you know, what do you think about this issue? So, and and on, on certain issues, I, I would actually go around the room. So it wasn't just at the end where I would say, okay, are you go or no go, but uh, on a particular issue would go around the room and get people's thoughts and, and make sure that we were hearing them. Um, in mesh, um, during a mission, we, um, as we had these mission management team meetings, of course there were open mics that people could speak at, um, but we also had um, like a box in the room that people could just drop, <laughs> you know, a note into because we know it can actually be pretty intimidating sometimes, particularly maybe for um, an early career employee, you know, and there's a, a group of senior managers that are kind of sitting around the table talking the issues and there's usually a lot of other supporting people. If you're an early career engineer, it's just human nature to be a little bit intimidated by that environment. And so we wanted to try to find alternate ways for people. And, and there were emails that you could use as well um, where you could um, bring up something and it would, it would go to the safety office and they could, they could bring it up. Um, and a person could actually remain anonymous if they wanted to. 
um, to do that. So we have to realize there's just a lot of things about human nature that can make it a little bit difficult to speak up if you feel like you have something to contribute. And so we try to sort of mitigate those barriers um, kind of one by one. Yes, second row. So suppose it's 2028. You're offered two possibilities. Uh, you can go stay on a, a lunar base for six months, or you can be part of the first crew tomorrow. <laughs> uh, which one would you choose? Uh, so you have to tell me a lot more about how much work has been done in the meantime. <laughs> um, but. Um, you know, I actually think I'll be a great candidate to go to Mars by that point because, as you know, one of the risks is the radiation risk. And um, I doubt that we will have solved that risk by then. We, we may have been able to do a few things to mitigate it. Um, but as you know, the older you get, the, the less risk it is because it's the risk of you developing cancer in the rest of your lifetime coming from this extra radiation. So the less of your lifetime you have left, then by definition, the risk is less to you. So, so like, I, I'll be perfect, you know, 2028, 20, I'll be right at the right age for that. And then the younger people can stay on the lunar base for six months. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I enjoyed speaking with you today. Once again, we want to thank you for being our guest speaker today. And as a token of our appreciation, we will provide you with this plaque. Thank you very much. Signed by the Director of Safety and Mission Insurance. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll get a picture here. we were so happy to have you here today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. All right, thank you. Very good talk. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. In closing, I would like to remind everyone, please fill out your feedback cards, and please look on the back, and if you have other uh, nominees for the Golden Eagle Award, we want to make sure that we capture those. Uh, it's important. You know, we're getting into the we're getting into the time where uh, we're getting very uh, more, much more excited about flying again. And so, the things that we want people to do is keep focused and don't lose your focus and pay attention to detail. And the example that we presented today is a perfect example of someone paying attention to detail and taking ownership of that hardware. And that's what we got to keep doing, and we got to emphasize that to all our younger folks that come on board and remind all of ourselves of the ones that are already here. That's what makes mission success. So thank you all for coming out today. And uh, as Janine said, our next session will be in 2020. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>